Hi, everybody. <laughs> My name is Kim Elena Ionescu. I am the Chief Sustainability Officer for the Specialty Coffee Association. And I'm uh, pleased to report that after listening to the first session today, the sustainability session is going to be less pessimistic than the economics session, which is not usually the case. Um, but I really, I'm really thrilled to be uh, here and to be presenting to you this panel and, and introducing this session on sustainability. Um, so on sustainability, do you all remember a time when sustainability wasn't ubiquitous? Was that like five years ago? Was it 10 years ago? I did a little bit of poking around preparing for this and I found this article from the Harvard Business Review, uh, 2009, a significant year for RICO. That was the first one of these events. Um, why sustainability is now the key driver of innovation. And this seems like about the time when we really began to see the acceleration of sustainability and the uptake of this across not just the coffee sector, but, but more broadly. In 2017, the SCA conducted our first member survey on sustainability. And of all of the question and answer pairings, the response that surprised me the most wasn't about the challenges that we face as an industry or the approaches that we should take to confront those challenges. It was a question that I really had only thought of as an intro question. Does your company identify someone responsible for leading sustainability efforts? 62% of our 600 plus respondents said yes. 62%. That's hundreds of people responsible for sustainability. And you know, you could argue that responsible isn't defined here, and that's true. And you could argue that that 600 plus group isn't representative of our industry, and that's also true. But no matter how many caveats you throw at this, I'm still gonna be surprised. Because we have so many more people now responsible for sustainability than we did at least in 2007 when the title sustainability manager appeared on my business card for the first time. Now, of course, naming a sustainability manager doesn't actually accomplish anything to making your business or the coffee sector more enduring. And we face plenty of obstacles to our endurance, from climate change to labor scarcity, the dismal state of profitability facing many coffee farmers, many aging coffee farmers, and it's hard to look at all of this bad news and think that we're better off than we were 10 years ago. But I'm gonna argue that we're better off than we were 10 years ago, you know, because I look at these issues and I wonder if we haven't always been enormously vulnerable and we just didn't want or didn't know how to see that. We have decades, in some cases, centuries of unsustainable agricultural and labor and purchasing practices to transform. And that transformation is not going to happen overnight. And for most of that time, it would have been possible for most of the people in this room not to think about it at all. But the way that we see things is changing. Places and people that once would have seemed so, so far away don't seem that far away anymore. You know, I imagine someone, a coffee drinker or even a coffee roaster, getting a copy of National Geographic in 1944 and looking at this spread of beautiful photographs of coffee production in El Salvador and thinking, wow, that's beautiful and amazing and totally foreign to me. And I contrast that with this picture of Emilio Lopez, a coffee producer from El Salvador, but also the chair of the executive council of the International Coffee Roasters Guild and a fixture in this community. It's the same place but we see it so, so differently. Two years ago, a fellow RICO presenter used a quote from the 19th century abolitionist Theodore Parker in his presentation. And this quote is about the arc of the moral universe, and it's been memorably paraphrased by Martin Luther King Jr. as to say that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Theodore Parker's original quote is a little bit longer. It says, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. 
And from what I see, I'm sure it bends toward justice. So I'm not here on the stage to offer trite, tidy solutions to complex and centuries old problems. But we have a panel and we have presenters today with decades of experience between them. And I know that they're all in it for at least another decade. So let's commit to seeing as far as our eyes will reach and to divining the rest by conscience. And with that, I will uh, introduce my esteemed panel, uh, Merling Preza, the general manager of Proto Co-op, come on up. <laughs> Molly Laverty, director of sustainability at Farmer Brothers Coffee. Lee Wallace, the CEO and queen bean of Peace Coffee. And Alejandro Cadena, the co-founder and CEO of Caravelli. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, Molly, I'd like to start with you. So, um, you know, I just mentioned this growth in people responsible for sustainability. Um, Farmer Brothers didn't have a chief sustainability officer, a sustainability director, a sustainability position 10 years ago, right? So what do you think motivated the establishment of your position in the department that you work in? Yeah, it's been an interesting path. I would say 10 years ago, um, there were internal initiatives towards sustainability. We had volunteers who were very passionate about social environmental issues in the workplace. We had a seed committee. Um, our green coffee buyers were very passionate about sustainability. They were the ones going to origin and seeing uh, the issues that farmer were, farmers were facing and really wanting to do something about it because of that exposure. Uh, what has changed, I think, since, since I started with Coffee Bean International and now Farmer Brothers uh, nine years ago was, is that our customers are demanding this now. So it's not just something that can be managed by volunteer effort or by those who are interested within, uh, within our company, but it's something that we see requirements for reporting, uh, high demand for anyone, uh, anyone customer who's demanding uh, different levels of traceability and sustainability, um, and it's just not something that, that we're able to not have a, a person in charge. Great, and am I supposed to use this? <laughs> Is it on? Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, you talked about this being a volunteer-led effort originally and something that um, you know, was maybe led by the coffee buyer, which is a position that you've also held. Um, but that now, you know, so I know that some of your customers, like um, McDonald's is one of them, and there are, um, there are other companies out there that are making uh, similar strides to make sustainability commitments of their own. It feels like uh, 10 years ago, maybe the roasters were really driving um, the dialogue and saying to the customer, well, here's what you can expect of sustainability. Here's what we know. You know, it's our job to educate you, and then you go out and educate the customer, uh, the end coffee drinker. And now more of that, um, uh, that expectation is coming from the customer. Um, do you see that happening? And is it a, you know, is this a good shift? Is it a sign that, like, our efforts at education have been working and they now believe, or is it motivated by something different? Uh, I think both is the answer to that question. Uh, Ten years ago, when we were talking about sustainability to customers, it was highly educational. They didn't really think about where coffee came from. It was more of a commodity. Um, speaking of, of customers for a company like Farmer Brothers, it was really a push uh, rather, rather than a demand from our customers. What I've seen change over the last 10 years is that demand coming from customers through the Sustainable Coffee Challenge. You see companies like McDonald's, Walmart, uh, other really big companies making 100% responsible sourcing commitments. Um, so as, as a roaster who's pushing responsible sourcing, that's exciting for, for me, and especially for the position that I hold at Farmer Brothers. But it also lends some ambiguity towards how we're gonna define what is sustainable coffee, what is ethical coffee in the future. Uh, in the past, that was defined by roasters and, and our, our collective experience and through forums like this, what, what, what is ethical and what is sustainable. Um, when we have this demand coming from the outside, I think it's our, uh, our duty as an industry to make sure that that definition is still holding to, true to what we know is sustainable coffee. Yeah. Um, I want to jump from the sort of consumer demand or the consumer 
customer pull on sustainability to talk a little bit about the perspective from the producer side. And um, to do that, I'm going to ask Merling questions in Spanish, and she'll answer in Spanish. And if you are not a Spanish speaker yourself, then uh, her words will appear, our words will appear on the, um, on the screen. So, uh, so get out your glasses if you're sitting in the back. Um, <laughs> Merlin, te quiero preguntar sobre qué has visto uh, en 25 años trabajando por parte de pequeños productores en Prodecoap. Um, ¿Crees que ha cambiado el papel o la influencia del pequeño productor o estamos en la misma situación de, en que estábamos hace 10 años? Gracias. Eh, yo creo que sí ha cambiado, eh, de 25 años para ahora hay muchos cambios. Antes el pequeño productor era invisible, en las últimas dos décadas ha habido mayor participación, mayor visibilización y, y relaciones nuevas. Sin embargo, eso no cambia eh, la situación del productor, porque en los últimos años hay menos posibilidades de negociar. Entonces, el ingreso del productor sigue siendo bajo, sigue teniendo problemas para sostener la vida de la familia y de la comunidad. Y ese tema de que el, el productor no puede sostenerse en el ingreso del, del café ha sido tomado por varias instituciones incluyendo, um, discutido en el Foro de, de Productores, Foro Mundial de Productores, el año pasado. Um, y me, da, me, me hace pensar si tú crees que nosotros, los compradores, estamos escuchando, estamos entendiendo que el productor no está, no, que la producción de café no es rentable o... Yo creo que se está escuchando, pero se está interpretando de diferentes maneras. Y hay muchos esfuerzos que vienen desde hace muchos años trabajando con café especiales, con relaciones directas, con certificaciones, etc. Pero no hemos logrado la sostenibilidad real, porque a la par van más demandas para los productores. O sea, ahora debemos trabajar, trabajar por el medio ambiente, que es nuestro modo de vida y tenemos que cuidarlo, pero tiene un valor. Tenemos que, que trabajar por nuestros colaboradores, deben tener mejores ingresos y mejores condiciones. Nuestros hijos no pueden trabajar y todo eso tenemos que garantizarle al mercado. Pero a cambio de eso, el mercado, ¿qué está dando a los productores? Hay un pequeño segmento que paga un poco más, pero en general el mercado no está respondiendo de la misma manera. O sea, Se está entendiendo... Sostenibilidad, muchas veces, solo una parte. Sostenibilidad ambiental o sostenibilidad social o sostenibilidad económica. Pero el conjunto, creo que no todos en la cadena lo estamos entendiendo ni todos estamos asumiendo nuestros roles correspondientes. Gracias. Um, Alejandro, I'd like to build on something that Merling just said about the um, increased expectations around sustainability on the part of, um, or by, by buyers. And uh, that kind of gap potentially between the understanding or the priorities of buyers and the priorities of uh, producers. And at, um, at Caravella, you know, you're in the middle of those. So probably constantly negotiating um, the gap between those expectations. Um, how do you see that how do you see that changing, or how do you see um, the the expectations of, of buyers either being elevated or just, or just changing over time? Well, I think um, there's never been better conditions for selling coffee. You know, as we saw this morning, um, consumers are willing to pay more for coffee. Um, they, they want to know more about where the coffee comes from and, and, and if it's sustainable or not, it's ethically traded. Um, and roasters have become a lot more stricter with farmers, as we, as we just heard. So those are good things, you know. There's good things happening. There's more competition. There's, 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 there's big companies investing in, in, in now the boutique players. So there's, a, there's, there's great things happening in the industry from the, from the demand side. 
But at the same time, what we're seeing is something that she just said, is that they've also become stricter, but we're seeing a trend where uh, the, the willingness to pay is not, con not concurrent to the demands that, that, uh, that roasters have. So they become stricter in quality, stricter in sustainability, you know, no child labor, all those kind of things, which is great. But the prices are not going up. Uh, on the contrary, I think prices are, are starting to go down. And we've never had uh, before a, a, in history a more critical situation on the, on the growing side. You know, we heard it this morning, climate change, labor scarcity, you know, generational problems. Uh, so the industry should be paying more, but what we're seeing is that the industry is now willing to pay less. And I think that's, that's concerning. So what, what's really happening is that the gap is widening. You know, 10, 15 years ago when I started in this industry, it was a race to, to pay the highest price. You know, roasters wanted to pay more money for better quality and for sustainability. And I think that trend is changing. And it, it used to be a very progressive industry, but I'm, I'm seeing tides of change towards more regression in the industry. And, and I, I think that's concerning. Um, we've talked before about the, um, you know, the sort of changing tastes of buyers at the very top end and how, um, you know, not only is it the, the expectation or the, um, is there a, a premium for better tasting coffees, but now it seems like uh, there may be as much or more of a premium pr placed on what's exotic. So um, not just a coffee that tastes you know, really extraordinary and scores really high, but also one that has an unusual variety for the country or the region in which it's planted, and one that is processed in a, an unusual or experimental way. And that um, at the same time that that's happening, uh, the, the demand or the desire for the kind of just consistently good, if we put it in point score terms, maybe the 85 or 86 scoring coffee, is, um, is diminishing. Um, can you speak to that a little bit more? And what happens when we, um, when we create further expectations for how these best of the best coffees taste and, uh, and do that at the expense of coffees that are just good? Well, yeah, competition coffees, you know, those coffees that are exotic, the naturals, the, 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 the honeys, the yeast processed coffees. There's, there's a growing demand for that. It's a very niche market. It's, it's very tiny if, if you look at the whole, the whole market. And yes, roasters are willing to pay ridiculous prices. You know, we've seen $600 a pound in auctions for uh, a, a natural geisha in, in auctions, and we've seen better prices at Cup of Excellence auctions. You know, competition coffees are, 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 are growing in price. But at the same time, those coffees, unfortunately, are very risky for, for small producers to produce. So what we're seeing is that you know, the bigger farmers which have the capital and the resources to, to take those risks and, make, and produce those amazing competition coffees that get you know, 90 plus, plus points and you know, get over $100 a pound, the, the, the small producer doesn't have access to that because they, they can't bear the risk. Of, of doing a natural or a honey or, you know, the, can't even afford the, the yeast. Or more, most often they don't even know how to produce those coffees. So, so the gap between the, the, the big um, producer and the small producer is growing because, yes, there is a growing demand for competition coffees which have, you know, prices no limit. But at the same time, the, the bulk of the coffees which are being produced by small producers, they're getting less and less prices. So, so the gap is widening, and, and, I, and I even call it, there's a growing inequality in coffee f production. And that's, that's, a, that's a real critical issue. You know, it's great that people want more quality, but you also want uh, roasters and the industry to understand that you know, there has to be a balance. So Lee, you know, you and I have talked, and you've mentioned uh, Peace's desire to be like a high quality, everyday coffee. So um, maybe sort of shooting for that middle that's quickly disappearing. Do you um, see that as your kind of way of uh, being a, a responsible buyer, or um, how does that, that desire to occupy that middle space connect to your company's sustainability philosophy? Sure. 
Yeah, we, I mean, we got started to buy coffee from small-scale producers. That's in our DNA. It's what we've always done. And through conversations with the people that we've been working, working with for a long time, we've also realized that this gap is appearing. And so what we're focused on is paying a good price, working with people over the long term. And then where we get really energized is by understanding that as we perfect our craft as roasters, as we hone our craft as roasters, um, and as we view ourselves as an integral part of the supply chain, um, we, can, we can make those coffees shine. So we have, we have real confidence in our model. Um, we find it very energizing. And um, our roasters will tell you that, that they really feel as if they're the last step in what is a tremendous amount of work. And if you think about all the work that the coffee has gone through and people have put into the coffee before it gets to our door, we really feel like it's honoring all of that work by saying, okay, what are we going to do with this coffee? Where is it going to sit in our lineup? And it's not that we don't buy single origin coffees that we really want to, to polish and, and make shine, but we also uh, really work to say, how can we put our best work to this coffee bean and make it taste really good for the, for the consumer. Yeah, and, uh, and you, know, you talked about being created to trade with small-scale farmers, and you know, Peace has a, an unusual history um, or an unusual sort of founding story being founded by an institute for, uh, for trade policy. Um, but uh, you know, I think that that has also contributed to um, the company having a seeing itself differently, maybe during uh, its growth. And so not only seeing that its mission is to buy the best coffee or put the, you know, be the most competitive in the marketplace, but also to, um, to creating a, a company culture that reflects um, the values that it applies to purchasing. And I think that that's, um, that's not common in coffee still. I think there are a lot of, uh, of examples of how the first area to be considered is the sustainable sourcing, and then everything else is kind of uh, is kind of when we get to it, when we have the resources. You know, our coffee is the most important thing, so everything else is inconsequential. And um, and I wonder, you know, if you see that uh, the work that you all do with your employees, with your community, with green initiatives, becoming a B Corp, um, how that is, you know, are there is it mutually supportive to the coffee? Uh, sourcing sustainability that you all and the commitments you have, or is it, um, are those sort of just two separate things? No, I, I think they're intimately connected. As we all know, you know, what we're doing in coffee is hard. It's not easy. When I first got involved in the business, um, you know, I was very naive and I thought, you know, oh, I'm going to be able to achieve so much, we're going to have so much impact. And um, it's only by understanding that if you're, you're crafting this truly sustainable business in every aspect of your operations, you really gain an appreciation for how long change takes and how hard you have to apply your heart and your soul and your mind to creating that change. Um, I think it also demonstrates to our employees um, that, that we're in this for the long haul. Um, and that we carry our heart, you know, all the way through from where the coffee is grown um, until we place it in our, in our customers' hands. Um, for us, getting B Corporation certified has been a big piece of that story. I know Caravella is also a, a B Corporation. There's other importers and coffee companies that are B Corporation certified, but it's a, a global community of people trying to use business as a force for good. And it's not just for small companies. Danone North America announced that they're B Corporation certified within the past couple days, so it's something you can use uh, no matter what the size of your company, um, but it really looks at all aspects of your operations from the environment to the community to your sourcing practices to the way you treat your employees um, and gives you a framework for improvement. Great. Um, do you want to build on that at all, Alejandro? Have you had similar experiences? As a Absolutely. Uh, B Corp has been an amazing thing for our company. We've been B Corp certified since 2014. And you know, when we approached it at the beginning, we said, oh, we're not, never going to get those 80 points. It's, 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 it's too hard to get 80 points, which is the minimum to, to be a B Corp. And then we started doing the self-assessment, and all of a sudden, we're, we're now at 140. And we had done anything to be a B Corp. You know, it, had, it had just been part of our DNA to you know, treat our employees well, to pay our, our, our suppliers at decent, decent prices, to work within the community, to work with the environment. And it's been, it's been an, an, an awesome journey just seeing how our employees, after we got the certification, they, they became prouder of what we're doing and more committed to what our mission is. Molly, as coming from a larger company, I imagine that there's a lot of the work that you do that can feel like incremental change, you know? Or when you have um, examples of uh, coffees that are really... Um, 
really extraordinary, that really stand out, that are, um, yeah, that are exemplary in their sustainability, that that might be only a small fraction of your total uh, coffee purchasing. So how do you balance the, um, the progress that on the one hand you're making with the magnitude of the work that has to be done? Yeah, it's a great uh, it's a great question. And the first session this morning had me thinking about how intimately linked sustainability efforts at Origin are to our global demand problems. Farmer Brothers is is equally excited about the uh, natural geisha micro lots, um, but we don't buy ten containers of of those kind of coffees uh, at six hundred dollars a pound. I don't think that would be a sustainable business model. Um, But what we do know as a company is we need coffee to be a coffee company. Um, It's not something that tomorrow or next year, uh, all of a sudden, there there won't be coffee to buy. But as Farmer Brothers looks uh, 10 and 20 years down the road, we should ensure now that those supply chains will continue to be able to deliver the kind of coffees that we use on an everyday basis. And uh, the the investments into into those initiatives need to start now but also productivity and, and quality improvements take time on a farm. It's not something that year over year you'll see a 100% increase in productivity on a farm. It involves a lot of hard labor, uh, years of productivity, uh, good fertilization. Um, so it's something that needs to be invested in now. And not just because, uh, not just because we feel like it's the right thing to do. And I come from a coffee buying background and have spent a lot of times on a lot of time on farms. I believe coffee growers should be paid more. Uh, I can't go back and change the entire industry because of my thoughts on that. Uh, I think it would also probably be illegal for us to all get together and decide to pay a different price for coffee. Um, but what we can do is look at our supply chains and secure what we know to be important for our customers and to continue to roast coffee in the volumes that we roast coffee. We need to be looking at our supply chain now to make sure they will be able to produce enough coffee for us to buy in the future. You mentioned the um, the slow process of some of this, uh, some of these improvements. You know that this stuff doesn't happen overnight, and it it also doesn't happen on like a quarterly returns basis. Do you feel like um, your customers and uh, and stakeholders understand that, or do you feel like you grapple with the pressure to um, to demonstrate? impact like immediately yeah it's it's a struggle uh i'm not gonna sit here and say it's so easy and that wall street totally understands our long-term sustainability initiatives um but (laughs) uh it is something that i as as sustainability and sustainably sourced coffees become more and more important one um for you know social acceptance of a company but also uh, for longer term risks, social risks to a company, you, you don't want to be the company who gets blasted in the news for having sourced coffee from a controversial place or in a controversial way. So those I- risks are being taken into account and you'll see Farmer Brothers, for example, in our, our SEC 10K reporting lists risks associated with climate change. So I think we see investors starting to understand sustainability risks, not just in terms of being the right thing to do, but in terms of a long-term financial risk for a company. Merlin, uh, Alejandro y Molly, ambos mencionaron uh, riesgos en la cadena para empresas que compran café. Y también um, Alejandro mencionó que hay a veces expectativas, expectativas por parte de los compradores sobre um, el, la eliminación del trabajo infantil, por ejemplo. Um, pero que a veces los compradores no están dispuestos de pagar un poco extra para cubrir los costos asociados con uh, el cumplimiento. Es un reto que ustedes están enfrentando. Um, hay costos uh, asociados con, esa, um, con la, el cumplimiento Los riesgos están en toda la cadena y en todo momento. Trabajamos sobre todo con los cambios eh, en el clima, eh, con los cambios en la forma de trabajar, los problemas de mano de obra en los países, (coughs) y siempre es un riesgo. Ahora, el pequeño productor organizado en cooperativa ha venido trabajando para superar esos riesgos. 
hemos venido trabajando con normas de certificación como las Fair Trade que nos permiten minimizar todos esos riesgos. Pero tenemos un precio mínimo, no un precio sostenible, que es muy diferente al mínimo. Entonces, tenemos un precio mínimo, tenemos que llegar a ese precio sostenible para hacer menos riesgosa toda la cadena, pero sobre todo tomar en cuenta que el café depende de la gente. Muchas veces vemos solo las plantas y si hablamos de sostenibilidad tenemos que irnos al objetivo de desarrollo sostenible. La gente debe tener que comer, la gente debe tener acceso a servicios y la gente debe poder invertir en la finca para producir más y mejor y minimizar riesgo. Entonces, creo que todos debemos enfocarnos más allá que en la planta, en el todo de la producción y la cadena del café. Y en tu experiencia, ¿ha habido más enfoque en la planta y menos en, en la gente? ¿Y crees que a través de la organización los productores pueden, um, en cooperativas por ejemplo, los uh, productores pueden uh, cambiar el, el equilibrio o tener una voz unida, una voz eh, hacia el, el mercado, los compradores, sobre la necesidad de cuidar la gente. Como dijo Rick en su presentación esta mañana, eso no estamos dando de comer a una hectárea, estamos dando de comer a una familia. Uh, ¿Puedes comentar en eso el, el papel de organización? Bueno, ese es el principal reto de nosotros, ¿verdad? Demostrar que el café lo trabajan manos y lo trabajan familias y que es posible en el mundo el mayor volumen lo producen los pequeños productores y deben articularse. Y en el caso del café, no solo los pequeños, los medianos y los grandes también, para lograr la sostenibilidad en, en toda la cadena. Yo creo que del tema, hoy por la mañana, el año pasado, el foro de productores, hemos venido hablando de sostenibilidad y con los pilares que tiene la sostenibilidad económico, social y ambiental. Todos creo que ya somos casi que expertos en el tema y en el concepto. Desde los productores lo que estamos esperando es cómo empezamos a dar pasos concretos hacia la sostenibilidad y que en el 2050 sigamos teniendo café y familias viviendo del café. Muy bien. Um, Lee, as, uh, as Merlin was talking about organization and I was thinking about cooperatives and the role of cooperatives in organizing small producers. You know, it also strikes me that we have cooperatives in, uh, in the consumption side of coffee too and, uh, and co-op coffees uh, comes to mind as one of those. And, um, you know, already today we've been told to collaborate. Last year at Rico we were told to collaborate. The last year before that, you know, we, we keep being told to collaborate and yet I feel like sometimes we ignore the examples of effective collaboration that have um, existed for a while. Um, you know, can, I know that there are challenges of, <laughs> you know, of collaborating also, but um, can you speak a little bit to, uh, to co-op coffees as a collaboration and, um, and your perspective on that? Yeah, absolutely. So in 1999, seven of us came together and we established our own importing company and it was out of a desire to trade directly with coffee farmers. Um, now there are 23 of us that own this importing company. It's a pre-competitive collaboration um, and we work together to run our business to maximize the benefits for producers and to source the kinds of coffees that we all want to sell, but in, in the way that really reflects producer voice and, and what we're hearing from coffee cooperatives and coffee farmers about what works best for them. Um, we always joke that it shouldn't work. It makes no sense. It sort of seems like this giant utopian um, dream, but uh, it does work for us. Um, we're competitors and we're collaborators. So from um, the roastery forward, we compete in the marketplace, uh, but from warehouse backwards, we collaborate and um, we, we run farmer to farmer exchanges at origin. Um, we have a fund that we all pay into to help uh, communities build resilience in the face of climate change. Um, we're really able to, to innovate quite a bit as as a group and, and to amplify our impact. That's great. Um, Alejandro, do you see examples of customers of yours working together or do you, see, and, and is that happening more now or do you see the landscape becoming maybe less collaborative than it was 10 years ago? Well, it's become more competitive, so uh, it's going the opposite direction. You know, 15 years ago, you know, you'd see a lot of roasters c collaborate with each other to, to buy the same coffee, to be able to, to buy a produces raw cooperatives coffee and, and most of the coffee. 
Uh, but these days, because of the competitive landscape, you see them less and less. So it, it's not going more, not, not becoming more collaborative. On the on the contrary, it's becoming less collaborative, which is an evolution of the of the industry. Uh, uh, but and there was there was also a lot more collaboration between roasters and and uh, and growers. So you would see a lot more of the roasters understanding that they couldn't cherry pick the coffee from a cooperative or a group of farmers. So they would they would buy you know, from a certain level uh, of quality to, to the top microlot, they would commit to buy all of it. Uh, that, that doesn't happen a lot now. You know, it's, it's that effect of the widening gap, I think, where, you know, roasters want to buy just the, 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 the very best and they're willing to pay whatever it takes to it. But they, the middle market, you know, the 85s, 86 point coffee, there's less demand for the, the, those now. So it's, it's, it's in a sense a, a little less collaborative than it used to be. And I, I think it's, you know, the word is regressive in, in, in a sense, which is, is surprising because, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's more difficult to grow coffee today than it was 15 years ago. So you'd, you'd think that roasters would be willing to, to, to understand that they need, they need to take a part in this industry and really help the, the coffee farmers to, to produce better coffee and pay them better. Um, I want to use that to sort of shift from talking about where we've been and where we are to, um, to I don't know about predicting, but um, it could be a combination of prediction and um, tasking the audience with, uh, with work that we all have to do. Um, but, you know, Alejandro, you mentioned, like, you think it's a less collaborative uh, marketplace or a regressive. We've regressed in, uh, in what we do in this um, or in that particular approach. And I wonder, you know, is that something that you would exhort this uh, audience to do more of, or what would you, you know, what would you like this audience to, to think about as we go out into um, our breakout sessions and our discussions, like in order to create a uh, more sustainable industry or um, to address some of the, the big challenges that you're seeing emerge? Well, it comes to mind that it's a great idea about collaboration, which is called World Coffee Research. You know, it's a, it's a fantastic idea. It's, it's, you know, we've seen a lot of development in, of technology for the roasting side and for the brewing side. You go to cafes these days and they have amazing contraptions to, to brew coffee and they have, you know, roasting intelligence and, and, and PIDs and all this technology that, that helps them own their craft much better. But at the farming side, there's hardly any technology. If, if you go to a coffee farm, what's, what's, what's the most advanced technology that a farmer has? A pulper? That's it, right? Uh, a refractometer? Yeah, that's, that's, that's all the technology that farmers have these days. So when, when World Coffee Research is, is telling people like we need to invest in technology and we need all the roasters and the industry to collaborate with this, this initiative, it's, it's an amazing idea. You know? it's, it's finally getting technology to the farmers, which are the, 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 the people that need technology the most. Uh, but then you go see who's contributed to World Coffee Research, and it's 100 roasters and about 25 traders putting in about $1.6 million a year in that. We just saw there were 30,000 roasters. And there's probably, what, 1,000 traders, importers? And only a very small fraction are actually contributing to World Coffee Research. And it's not a, it's not a lot of money. It's half a cent per pound or a pound, a, a, dollar, a cent per pound that you have to contribute to World Coffee's research. It's not a lot of money. When you think about, you know, the five cents it costs to, to produce uh, a cup of coffee, but there's hardly anybody really contributing to World Coffee research. You know, we work with over 250 roasters or, around the world, and only 11 roasters are contributing to the checkoff program. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just go down the line. Lee, I'd, ask, I'd like to ask you the same thing. You know, what would you like uh, this audience to, to take away and think about? And I, I'd like you to especially, um, given your, uh, your position and sort of pieces, years in the industry, but also still, you know, relative size in the sort of medium space, like as a, for the small business owners or the retailers in the audience, um, what would you like, you know, like, what would you like them to do? What do you see the need for us to do? Absolutely. 
I mean, I, I think it follows, follows right along um, from what Alejandro said is, um, I think that I would really encourage my peers um, who are running small to medium-sized coffee companies, and that's a lot of us. That's a lot of the membership of the Specialty Coffee Association, and I don't think people realize that, um, is to really expand your definition of sustainability and what is sustainable coffee buying and begin to find space in your brain to lean into some of these conversations. I know we all got involved in this because we love coffee, but there's a huge package of things that go, go around um, running a sustainable business, and you can still keep coffee at the heart of your business. So um, I encourage you to explore, to get more involved in the industry, and uh, to learn about ways you can support efforts to make coffee more sustainable and make your business more sustainable. Thank you. All right, you got to hear some claps for that too. <laughs> I like it. I like this crowd. Um, Molly, what about you? What's your, um, what's your recommendation or, uh, or desire from the audience? Um, I think thinking of uh, companies like Farmer Brothers and larger roasters really starting to understand our supply chains. They're, they're complex. It's not um, all directly sourced from farmers, but that traceability and transparency we need to have to understand the needs of our supply chain is really important. Um, that kind of research is, it can be expensive, um, but really understanding what those needs are will allow us as an industry to funnel our resources to the right places that are gonna have an impact rather than um, blindly and crossing our fingers that, that it'll, that'll have, make a difference. So, I mean, echoing these collaborative efforts into research and understanding, it's hard to think about um, justifying those kind of spends when it's not gonna be something that you'll see next quarter but that research is going to be what we need to base our future decisions on. Merlin, mi otra última pregunta para cada uno de ustedes es, um, mirando el futuro y pensando en esta audiencia, siendo gente que puede efectuar cambios, ¿qué te gustaría um, pedir de esta audiencia, ¿qué te gustaría uh, decirles que ellos um, llevan a sus negocios o hasta las discusiones que van a tener en el almuerzo sobre la sostenibilidad de tu perspectiva? Pedir es mucho, ¿verdad? Pero creo que principalmente trabajar juntos en la cadena para lograr los tres pilares de la sostenibilidad económica, social y ambiental. Desde nosotros hay un compromiso a, a trabajar por la sostenibilidad, pero queremos que sea recíproco, de que todos trabajemos para lograrla en el mediano plazo si queremos tener café. Pero sobre todo un mensaje que me dijeron hoy por la mañana, no puedes hablar de sostenibilidad si no hablamos de las mujeres y el rol de las mujeres en la producción de café y los jóvenes si queremos tener café en el futuro. Entonces, all right. Well, I'd like to thank you all. Um, thank you to my panel. Thank you. Um, we'll be transitioning now into our speakers. Um, but if I could get a round of a, another round of applause, you've been a generous audience. <laughs>